Good morning and welcome to Toronto Police Headquarters. Today I would like to introduce Inspector Peter Callahan of Financial Crimes for the launch of Fraud, Fraud Prevention Month. Sir. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Toronto Police Headquarters. I'm Inspector Peter Callahan of uh, the Toronto Police Financial Crimes Unit. Thank you for joining us as we kick off Fraud Prevention Month. This morning we are joined by representatives from the Competition Bureau of Canada, the Ontario Securities Commission, Bank of Canada, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and later I will be introducing you to a victim of rental fraud, Virginia Stoymanoff. Fraud Prevention Month is an annual event designed to promote the recognition, prevention, and reporting of fraud. This year marks the 15th anniversary of this annual education and awareness campaign. The Toronto Police Service will be hosting some exciting events for the month of March. One of the events that I'd like to highlight this morning is our fifth annual Don't Be Fooled event, a cooperative initiative of the Financial Crimes Unit, 12 Division, and the Toronto Catholic District School Board. Don't Be Fooled will be held on March 28, 2019, starting at 9.30 a.m. at St. Oscar Romero Secondary School, located at 99 Humber Boulevard in Toronto. Don't Be Fooled was created for students who are active on social media platforms to encourage them to be smart in their use of social media, protecting their money and their reputation. We invite the media to join us at Don't Be Fooled on March 28th. Fraud does not discriminate with respect to age, race, culture, socioeconomic status, or level of education. Everyone is vulnerable to the clever story presented by the fraudster in pursuit of their goal of having us hand over our hard-earned money. The sad result of fraud is often devastating financial loss and shattered lives. We are proud to work with all our partners that you will see here this morning to combat the evil that is fraud. The Competition Bureau of Canada is the driving force behind Fraud Prevention Month. Working with 125 law enforcement agencies, public and private sector organizations to combat fraud. The Toronto Police Service is proud to collaborate with the Competition Bureau on this important initiative. At this time, I would like to inv uh, invite Josephine Palumbo, De Deputy Commissioner, Decept Deceptive Marketing Practices of the Competition Bureau to say a few words. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for that kind uh, introduction. Um, and thank you also to our host, the Toronto Police Service, today. Merci également à notre hôte d'aujourd'hui, la police de Toronto. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us today to help us launch the 2019 Fraud Prevention Month. This is, in fact, a landmark year as 2019 marks the 15th anniversary of Fraud Prevention Month in Canada. It is an educational campaign organized by the Fraud Prevention Forum, a group of more than 100 public and private sector organizations, which is chaired by the Competition Bureau of Canada. Il s'agit d'une campagne d'éducation organisée par le Forum sur la prévention de la fraude, un groupe de plus de 100 organisations de secteurs publics et privés, précédés par le Bureau de la Concurrence. When it comes to fighting fraud, we believe knowledge is power. The more educated Canadians are about the various types of scams, the less likely they are to become victims. And for this reason, the Bureau's goal is to better equip Canadians to fight fraud. Every Canadian can join the fight against fraud. It's all about recognizing the signs, rejecting suspicious claims, and reporting them to the authorities. The Bureau has a number of tools available on their website, including the Little Black Book of Scams, Edition 2, a new publication to help protect businesses from fraud, a quiz to help Canadians test their knowledge, anti-fraud videos, and promotional material tailored for all major social media platforms so Canadians can spread the word. This year, the Bureau will also meet with consumers and business owners from across the country to give them information and tips they need to recognize, to reject, and to report fraud. Cette année, le Bureau rencontrera également des consommateurs et propriétaires d'entreprises de partout au pays pour leur donner l'information et les conseils dont ils ont besoin pour reconnaître 
rejeter et signaler la fraude. The Bureau will also issue three new videos featuring health scams, emergency scams, romance scams. To reach new Canadians and ensure they are equipped to stand up to the scammers, the Bureau is translating the Little Black Book of Scams second edition into six languages, Cantonese, Mandarin, Punjabi, Tagalog, Arabic, and Spanish. So remember the three R's, recognize, recognize fraud. Fraudsters are sophisticated and creative, so questioning the legitimacy of every inquiry, no matter how official it may appear to be, is a good policy to have in place. Be vigilant, be on the lookout. Reject it. If it, you receive a suspicious email, delete it. If you question the legitimacy of a telephone call from an unfamiliar source, hang up. If you, you receive something in the mail asking you to forward personal information or credit card details, throw it out. Trust your instincts. Report it. By reporting a scam, you can provide law enforcement with the information they need to stop fraudsters and help prevent others from becoming victims. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre estimates that only 5% of frauds get reported to the authorities. And this means that the law enforcement agencies have a lar harder time to stay ahead of the game and bring fraudsters to face justice. Reporting suspected fraud is one of the best ways for Canadians to help authorities gather evidence and bring down fraudsters to better protect consumers and businesses. Over the course of the month of March, the Bureau and its partners from the Fraud Prevention Forum will lead a number of activities to raise awareness about new and ongoing scams. Stay connected to make sure Canadians are properly equipped for the fight against fraud. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Josephine. At this time, I'd like to call upon uh, Manuel Pereira, Regional Director of Currency from the Bank of Canada, who would like to say a few words. <clears throat> Thank you. Let me just get my, oh, here we go. Oh. Sorry, I just got a little IT issue. Here we go. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to represent the Bank of Canada at the official kickoff of Fraud Prevention Month. We proudly join the Toronto Police, the Competition Bureau, and distinguished speakers today and numerous organizations across Canada to remind Canadians to recognize fraud, reject it, and report it. As the Bank of Canada is solely responsible for issuing Canadian banknotes, it has an interest in a sound payment and financial system and a strong economy. We recognize that fraud in its various forms can have a serious impact on confidence in the marketplace. The Bank of Canada works closely with key stakeholders and partners to spread the word on counterfeiting, protecting potential victims from losses. While we have seen a significant decrease of counterfeiting over the years, despite our success, we continue to see victimization of this type of fraud and continue to work at reducing counterfeiting in Canada. Awareness is not enough. Canadians need to take action. They must check their banknotes, touch the race texture, smooth surface, tilt the banknote, look at the holographic stripe, and through the window. We recognize that banknotes are only one uh, of a number of payment options available to Canadians. We encourage retailers and consumers to expect the check. Why? Because checking banknotes is the authorization process for cash transactions. By checking security features, retailers can keep fake money out of cashiers' tills, customers' wallets, and Canada's cash supply. We work hard to earn our money. Why not invest a few seconds to protect it? Fraud is a crime of opportunity. The success of criminals depends on whether or not retailers and consumers are vigilant. As you know, the Bank of Canada issued a new $10 bill late last year. This new $10 bill has depictions of Viola Desmond and the Canadian Museum of Human Rights and acknowledges the past and continued efforts towards achieving rights and social justice for all Canadians. In addition, to stay ahead of counterfeiting, we have included bold security features that are easy to check and difficult to counterfeit, ensuring that Canadians can use it with confidence. The Bank of Canada and our partners here today recognize that it is our role to provide you with information and tools needed to fight fraud on the front lines. Our goal is to provide clear, simple, and easy tools and services needed to make that happen. Regardless of the type of fraud, it's quick and easy to fight it once you know what to look for and how to stop it. The fight against fraud starts with you. Learn to recognize, reject, and report it. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. At this time, I'd like to call uh, Henry Tso, 
Vice President, uh, Investigative Services from the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Thank you very much. At Insurance Bureau of Canada, putting a stop to insurance fraud is high on our list of priorities. My industry, Ontario's home, car, and business insurers, is proud to support police services as they work to prevent crime. People often view insurance fraud as a victimless crime, but that's not true. They're real human and financial costs. When criminals cheat the system, the people of Ontario end up paying the bill. The bill is estimated at $1.6 billion every year in Ontario. And the financial losses due to fraud on a national scale is even far greater. It's important to point out that when it comes to fraud, every link in the chain of events takes a hit. It's not just the driver and insurance company that are affected. For example, criminals who stage collisions are wasting time that police officers, emergency responders, and hospital staff could be spending on people with real emergencies. Fraud cases also add to the volume our, to our court system has to handle and gets in the way of real cases. The tax money that people in Ontario pay for all these services is being wasted when fraud is part of the picture. The biggest fraudsters, from a dollar perspective, include disreputable towing and body shops, organized criminal groups, and healthcare professionals who build a system for treatments that were never needed or provided. Smaller scale fraud by individual homeowners also affect the system. If a homeowner cheats the system by exaggerating the losses in a house fire, for example, he might think he's just getting back what he's owed for all those premiums he paid over the years. What he's really doing is stealing money that could have helped someone with real losses get back on their feet. Believe me, members of the insurance industry in Ontario would much rather deploy money and resources in the name of helping their customers that they would on then find investigating fraud. And I'm sure our law enforcement agencies partners would all agree. So if they cheat on insurance, who pays? You do, we all do. If you suspect of having any knowledge of insurance scam, I urge you to call the Insurance Bureau of Canada. We do have a tip line at one eight seven seven ibc tips or one 422 8477 IBC and insurers are committed to working with law enforcement agencies, government, and other stakeholders to fight fraud. It is an honor to stand with them today as we focus on this costly crime. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. I just got the, uh, that's why I wrote you the speaking notes boss uh, lectures, because I skipped someone. So I'm gonna call on uh, Tyler Fleming, uh, Director, in Investor Office from the Ontario Securities Commission to say a few words. Thank you and good morning everyone. Uh, investment fraud uh, is devastating for people. People often lose their retirement savings, the money they save for the future. Um, we know one in 20 Canadians report being the victim of investment fraud. And so we at the Ontario Securities Commission, we're meeting people at the front lines to educate them on some of the warning signs and red flags of fraud and ways they can protect themselves. Uh, in the cases that we see, there are some commonalities we often see. And so I'll go through three red flags of investment fraud right now. Uh, so one, promises of high return with little to no risk. So if someone's promise, promising a high return, saying it's guaranteed, you'll get it for sure. Uh, you know, GICs are maybe 2 to 3% right now from your bank or credit union. If someone's promising you much more than that, uh, it's saying it's guaranteed, that's a big red flag. Uh, a second red flag is if you're pressured to buy. So fraudsters will try and take advantage of your emotions, your fear of mess missing out and try and pressure you to, to invest in something. And so make sure you take the time to understand the investment, to do your homework, to educate yourself. Never feel pressured to buy or make a decision on the spot. That's something fraudsters will try and, and get you with. And then third, a third red flag of uh, investment fraud is if the person is not registered with the securities regulator, in my case, the OSC. Uh, registration means that we know who they are, we know their background, 
we don't know if they have a disciplinary history. And if they're not registered, uh, and they're supposed to be, that's a big red flag. Our website, uh, getsmarteraboutmoney.ca, millions of people use it every year. It's got hundreds of free tools, calculators, and other resources to help people uh, with their money, including spotting the red flags of fraud. And again, that website is getsmarteraboutmoney.ca, and we encourage you to visit it. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. At this time, I'm going to call upon uh, Rachel Jollycourt of Interact, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, and good morning. I'm pleased to be with you here this morning. Interact welcomes the opportunity to support Fraud Prevention Month. One of the ways Interact helps consumers by detecting and preventing fraud is by educating the public. With the help of our partners and law enforcement, we keep up to date on the latest fraud trends. Did you know that Canadian victims lost a combined 62 million due to phishing scams in 2018? In fact, we're amongst the top four countries in the world to be targeted by phishing attacks. With online and mobile payments on the rise, we've seen an increase in phishing scams. Last year, we saw an increase in phishing scams that are aimed at accessing your money using SMS text messaging that's called schmishing. In today's complex digital landscape, hackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated. This means it's becoming more difficult to tell a real from a fake. A new study we recently conducted shows that 96% of Canadians fail to spot a fraud when we put them to the test. At Intrac, we work closely with our partners to manage fraud risk systematically and arm Canadians with the information they need to spot, avoid, and report scams that they may come across. Our message to Canadians is to be on the alert. If you receive a message that makes you suspicious, trust your, your instinct and verify the source. This is how you can help fight fraud on the fraud line. Familiarize yourself with the latest scams and report any incident to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Again, it's a pleasure to support Fraud Prevention Month. Together, we can help keep our community safe. Thank you. For the Toronto Police Service, it's important to put a human face on fraud. So this morning, we've invited uh, Virginia Stoymanoff here to the media gallery to share with you her story so people can understand the impact that fraud has on in individuals in our community. Virginia? Put this stool for me. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Virginia Stoymanov, <clears throat> and I've been scammed by a repeat tenant scammer, also known as a tenant from hell, and who's a professional tenant. <clears throat> she also duped the Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> My ordeal started in April 2010 when I leased my old matrimonial home to the perfect tenant who presented as a family of husband who worked in construction and loved to fix little things. Excuse me. <coughs> and the wife who loved gardening and would keep the ground beautiful and a 17-year-old daughter. I checked all the information. Her landlady stated that there was that she was there for six years and left the place better than when she moved in. Her supervisor at Marcus Evans confirmed that uh, Nina worked there, had a secure job, and earned $62,000 a year. And her personal reference said that she was a good tenant, a good honest person who would make a good tenant. I even told my son, who did all the maintenance work for the house, that this tenant almost seems too good to be true. She paid her first and last month's rent but her first post-dated check for May the 1st, uh, 2010, bounced. Nina <coughs> Willis apologized profusely and paid before the end of May, but the June check also bounced. I called her to tell her to get overdraft protection so that she wouldn't be charged the penalty. 
and thought that she might be having marital problems since I had not seen her husband. I told her I would not hold her to the lease if she needed to get a cheaper place to live. I also started recalling all her references. I found that Nina did not work at Marcus Evans and that the person that I had spoken to who was supposed to be her uh, manager, uh, her, it was her sister who no longer worked there. When I finally spoke to her previous landlady, I learned that uh, she would only lived there for six months, not six years, and was evicted for non-payment. On further checking, I found that I was her fifth or sixth victim. One landlord was so traumatized that he would not even speak to me because he did not want to get involved with Nina Willis again, who pulled the same things on him for more than two years and without paying rent. He was afraid of all the bad people that she had around her and feared for his life. He had her before the landlord and tenant board several times and finally sold the house to get rid of her. All this so far was my fault for not doing a credit check and speaking personally to the previous landlord at the previous residence, which is what I always did, because her references were so good. But the real fault lies with the landlord and tenant board. Nina Willis's modus operandi is first, pay first in mass last month's rent, pay the next uh, one or two months in dribbles, and as soon as an eviction notice is issued, immediately call the public health inspector and a, a property standards officer to find fault with the house, even though her lease stated that any fault must be reported to the landlord immediately for remediation. The public health inspector was first called in December 2010 and uh, for mold in a tightly sealed dugout under the front porch, and the property standards officer was called in January 2011 with problems that were never problems, <coughs> including graffiti on the ceiling over the stairs. Now, at this point, she had been there for 10 months, and uh, there was never, the house was perfectly clean when she moved in. No house could pass this close of examination. I could take the time today to outline everything, but the problems were so picayune, it would just be a waste of time. The first hearing at the Landlord Tenant Board was January 5th, 2011, when Nina was ordered to either pay back all the rent or be evicted by January 17th. I went to the sheriff's office and the earliest date for the eviction was on Monday, May the 7th. On the morning of May the 7th, she filed an interim order to stay the order of eviction and filed a notice of appeal with the Ontario Superior Court of Justice Divisional Court. Nina then filed the amended T2 and T6 Landlord Tenant Board forms for charges against me for $13,800 and gave me a fax copy on the Saturday evening for the hearing on the Monday. That was February the 7th. At this point, I was completely blindsided and didn't know what the heck was going on. I tried to hire a lawyer, but no one would come on such short notice. So I attended on February the 7th with only my son and requested an adjournment, which was ignored and the tenant was ordered to proceed. She rambled on until we were out of time and I could only read my prepared evidence and written response to her allegations, which, left, which I left with the board, and the case was postponed till April the 5th, from February the 7th. I was then notified that Nina had requested a new hearing date, which was set for March the 1st, which was to be a request for review of the January 5th hearing at which she had asked for a lawyer. She was granted the review with a new hearing date for April the 5th, which, to be, which was to be heard de novo of the January 5th hearing, which means start over from the very beginning. I had, <clears throat> I had hired a lawyer at $400 an hour for the March 1st hearing uh, who could not make a case for dismissal. Not only did the adjudicator member keep us to the last case at $400 an hour, she instructed Nina to pay less than two months back rent in trust to the board when she was in arrears for eight months at that point. The hearings on February the 7th and April the 5th were a total farce with an inept member, Gerald Taylor, who retired or was fired from the landlord tenant board after this case. He could not keep the hearings focused. 
despite the fact that the April 5th hearing was specifically for a review of the January 5th non-payment hearing, and Nina arrived 50 minutes late and without a lawyer, <coughs> the member let her proceed until time ran out again. A new date was scheduled for June the 8th, the 5th. After another two months, he finally rendered his report on June 27th as a final order, ordering the tenant to vacate the premises on June the 30th, three days hence, and to pay the amount due. Nina Willis then went to the Superior Court of Justice Divisional Court again and got another stay of eviction with a new hearing in the Divisional Court scheduled for Monday, August the 2nd, for which uh, I had to hire another lawyer. The tenant did not appear, and the court ordered that the order of June the 8th be reinstated. She was finally evicted on August 24, 2011, leaving me with whopping water, hydro, and gas bills. The whole process with the Landlord and Tenant Board was a gut-wrenching total of seven hearings with the Board and the Superior Court of Justice Divisional Court over a 10-month period and a total cost to me of $28,578. The, uh, the, the rent owing alone was $13,550, with the filing fee, NSF checks, and sheriff's fee altogether uh, $14,145. The mold removal, which was just a, a dugout under the porch, uh, I had to get that uh, uh, the mold taken out and uh, air tested for $3,546, and the maintenance, that really uh, was, was small little things, it, it was a total for $919. The water bill alone was 2216 the hydro bill was 771 and the Indian Bridge gas was only 5246 Now, my lawyers, uh, the Garfin and then Zeidenberg, was 2800 landlord uh, legal, uh, paralegal was 23,377, and David Strachan for the uh, divisional court was uh, 1,750. So altogether, it was 28,578. And since this case, I've learned that our many professional tenants like Nina Willis, usually with the same modus operandi. Some have been reported to the media, but the number is astounding and there are likely to be a lot more because of the very high rents in our city. The Landlord and Tenant Board is geared to protecting tenants, and most tenants do need protection, but there has to be some protection for the hapless landlord like, like me, who was blindsided by these scammers and their modus operandi. At that time, I had written several letters to the chair of the Landlord Tenant Board, Dr. Lillian Ma, to Rick Bartolucci, MPP, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Kathleen, Kathleen Wynne, MPP, New Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Peter Tabins, MPP, NDP, Housing Critic, the Ombudsman of Ontario, and finally a face-to-face -face meeting with Mr. Michael Gottiel, Executive Chair at Social Justice Tribunals, with a list of recommendations. Several months after that meeting with Mr. Gottiel, his secretary phoned me to say that he had forwarded the recommendations to the appropriate people. That was in 2012. And as far as I'm aware, there's no change in the Landlord Tenant Board. There's still more to this story. With the help of my paralegal and the police department, we were able to incarcerate, incarcerate uh, Nina Willis to six months in jail, but she got out in four. I was invited to attend her parole hearing at which Nina tearfully said she was sorry and would not do it again. In early 2016, 2016, I got a call from April Stewart, my paralegal, who said, you won't believe this, but I'm acting for another landlord whose new tenant from hell is Nina Willis, just two months after she was released from jail. The Toronto Star printed the story on Tuesday, March the 12th, 2016, and I have that article in the paper it's all, all written down in here. <coughs> the Residential Tenancy Act must be revised. These professional tenants are known to the Landlord Tenant Board, the Superior Court of Justice, Divisional Court, and the Sheriff. 
The, sh the suggestions I and many others respectfully made to the people I wrote to were, one, the tenant may apply to the Landlord-Tenant Board on only two properties uh, to refute the landlord's eviction application before <coughs> red flags are raised. And two, the Landlord-Tenant Board must keep records of tenants who have repeatedly applied to the board to abort evictions and consult these records when a tenant has applied to the Landlord-Tenant Board on more than two properties. These records must be made available to a landlord if requested and must be consulted by the adjudication member. Thank you for, for your attention. If there's any questions, I'll be pleased to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I'd like to take uh, exception to one thing Virginia said, which is that it was her fault. And that is often the case with fraud victims, is they're made to feel like what happened is their fault. And it's, it's not their fault. This is a crime. And that's why Fraud Prevention Month is so important to the Toronto Police Service. We want people to recognize it, reject it, and report it so that we can all fight uh, fraud together. Um, the members that spoke this morning will remain for the media members that are present if anyone has any questions and if anyone has any questions of me I'll take them now okay thank you all for coming this morning thank you that concludes today's conference